So um, we're now months into this pandemic. What's been the hardest part for you um, of adapting to such an abrupt and rapid global shift of video conferencing and remote work? Yeah, well, this uh, happened so quickly because, uh, you know, the Zoom was built to serve a lot of enterprise and business customers, you know, in terms of capacity, functionality. But over the night, you know, there are so many first time users or consumers to start using Zoom platform you know, for all kinds of different use cases. So the, the hardest part is how we can quickly transform our business to embrace first time users to support all kinds of new use cases in terms of service availability, privacy, security, functionality. I think we got to quickly adapt to that. So that's the hardest part of the past months. And presumably, as we were all um, sort of being thrown into work from home, you guys were at pretty much exactly the same time, maybe a little bit earlier. So how did you and your team have to change the way you worked in order to do all the things you were talking about just now um, and still give us all the ability to work from home as well? Well, when the pandemic crisis started and here in the United States in early March, you know, we quickly made a decision to send all employees back at home because employee safety is always number one priority. Also, because we have almost uh, one third of uh, our U.S. based employees already working remotely prior to pandemic crisis. I think we also have a tools called Zoom. And so I think by and large, we know how to work together remotely. I think from productivity perspective, there's no problem. The problem is how we can, and not only do we know we can support Zoom employees, how we can work it together as a team, everyone working remotely, you know, to keep the service up and to serve for the world, right? To make sure other businesses can count on Zoom, still can be product productive. That's a challenge, but our team, we are working so hard and I think we adapted to this very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, Zoom could become a company that lives and functions and works entirely on Zoom? I believe so, but however, also there's a challenge, right? Because if you, all of us, always work from home for such a long time, you might have a different problems, like a mental health, anxiety, depression. I think in the future, it's more like a hybrid. For sure, we can work from home without any productivity loss, but we still prefer, right? You know, sometimes, you know, maybe this week, next week, we all go back to office, right? With the traditional working experiences, it's also very important. I think the future is about a hybrid. Mm -hmm. So how do you um, talk to me a little bit about sort of what that hybrid experience then looks like? Because as we sort of move sort of the dial a little bit where sort of video becomes much more prominent in our day to day lives, what is the experience that we can expect in the future? I don't think we or you want Zoom in 2030 to look exactly like it looks now. So what are some of these things we can expect? I think a hybrid, first of all, means, you know, used to be employer, they are making a decision, right? All the employees will go to the office, work together physically in the office. You know, hybrid means, you know, some employee, they might work from home, some employee, they might work in the office, or maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, everyone can go back to home to work. However, to support this kind of uh, hybrid working environment, for sure, you know, your technology, you've got to improve. Otherwise, the tools like Zoom, I think can help, but that's not about the, the, the future. The future can let you feel like no matter where you are, you still feel like in the same office. An online conferencing experience like Zoom can even deliver a much better experience than face-to-face -face meeting, than in the office meeting. Like a, like a remote handshaking, if I want to shake hands with you, 
you will feel my intimacy, right? And also real-time language translation, all those cool features will be added in the future collaboration to further support working anywhere with any device. Mm -hmm. so, so I can see how a uh, translation would work, but how, how would a virtual handshake work? So you look at AI technology or AR technology. So I wear uh, just a normal eyeglass, something like that. And if I try to shake hand, shake hand with you, you will feel my hand shaking and with some special devices. And I think that will be doable in the future. I'm not saying today, but in 10 or 15 years, those technologies will be ready. Got it. So one of the things you were saying that about that has been hardest for you in terms of adapting to, to this sort of very rapid change is that so many of your users now are sort of beyond the original use cases that you um, anticipated. So when we were chatting last week, you were mentioning that you are now, um, Zoom is now used by thousands of educational institutions around the world. I, I'm, we've heard a lot over the decades really about how the future of education is going to be remote and online. So what are you seeing um, in terms of the future of education that we're now in? I think online teaching, online learning are becoming mainstream. And uh, prior to this pandemic crisis, a lot of universities are already deploying Zoom and for online teaching, online learning. During this pandemic crisis, a lot of K to twelve schools, you know, around the world, like uh, you know, we 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 offer the free service to more than ten thousand K to twelve schools. They also can leverage Zoom platform for online teaching. I truly believe in the future. Also, this is more like a hybrid as well. You know, students they want to go to campus physically, they can, or if they want to stay at home, they also can use the tools like Zoom for online teaching, for online learning. I think this is the future. I think in 10 or 20 years, it's very likely most of the learning are going to be done online. So physically, the campus probably will be a small portion of the online learning experience. Understood. Um, so I have one question for you now, um, and then we'll go to community questions. But. Um, Silicon Valley in the tech industry is not really known for being ahead of the curve when it comes to ethical considerations and thinking about the ethical implications of their products. Um, what are the ethical challenges that you've faced um, of growth at this kind of speed? Like, are you able to be deliberate about that when things are changing so quickly? Yeah, so first of all, you know, Silicon Valley is not only for the worldwide innovation center, but also from ethical perspective, also got to set up a great example for all others to follow. I think first of all, you know, we got to take a step back, always listen, to listen what's happening, what's happening in the community, in the society, and don't be eager right, to make a decision. Really sit down, listen to end user to the community to society to understand what's happening and then take a step back and try to think about what we can do to further leverage the technology to embrace the potential changes i think if we can follow this formula i think a silicon valley still can deliver a much better job than anywhere else than any other places in terms of embracing new changes embracing ethical challenges. I think that's the path. But, but when things have been changing this quickly, did, are you able to do that? Yeah, I think so. Because you look at the culture here of Silicon Valley, you know, as so many great entrepreneurs, this is an open and exchange of ideas, everyone trying to help, to help to make the world a better place. We all share the same vision what we can do to leverage technology to make the world a better place that's the culture of silicon valley that's why i have a high confidence yes we can adapt to anything quickly great um so let's take a couple of questions from the community how did zoom beat out the googles apples facebook's of the world 
did you see this crisis coming in a way that they did not? Well, I don't think we are beating out our competitors. So on day one, you know, when I started Zoom, a lot of people already told me that there's so many solutions out there. How can you compete against you know, those competitors that are very, very big? So we, do, we never wanted to focus on competitors. We spend all the time talking with our users, customers. We try to be the first vendor to really understand customer side problems. And we got to take a step back, understand why. And then we wanted to be the first vendor to come up with a solution to serve the customers in terms of ease of use, in terms of functionality, the quality. We do not look at the competitors. So, but we are working harder right, to only you know, figure out a way to serve our customers better than any others. Got it. Um, next question, please. What are some of the innovative ways in which people have been adapting to your platform to stay connected? When we build a platform, the, the, main, the main use case is about the business collaboration, the business communication. Like I talk with our employees or employee talking with uh, customers or partners. I think during this uh, pandemic crisis, a lot of uh, the consumer driven use cases like uh, the yoga class, the online wedding ceremony or Zoom marriage is legal in New York, right? How those users leverage the Zoom platform, how people truly stay connected. I think this is something very creative. We never thought about that before, like a, a wedding ceremony. Maybe you'll be able to conduct one yourself soon. You can be the officiant. <laughs> yeah. um, let's go to another question, please. Concerns have been raised about privacy and security on Zoom, and Zoom has responded. But how have you been approaching privacy as Zoom continues to grow? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I mentioned earlier, when we built the business and the services, when we started, all the use cases are around serving enterprise and the business customers. So in terms of security, we already had a built-in security features to serve enterprise customers, a lot of security features. Normally, the way it works, works is that we're working together with you know, enterprise IT team. They enable or disable security features and also with the onboarding process before any employees start using Zoom. In terms of serving first-time users, we should have done a better job because we cannot assume those consumers, like take a K-12 schools, they may not have IT team. We need to simplify a package that enable those security features for them by default. So from that perspective, we got to change. Over the past 90 days, we made it a bigger change, right? Always look at how to serve those first time users better. In terms of privacy, as this Zoom continues to grow, we need to change our company culture because not only, not only do we serve for enterprise and business customers anymore, how to make sure when it, when, when it comes to a balance between the privacy, security, and the functionality innovation, privacy, security, always very, very important. Always number one priority. I think as we, if we can change our company culture to embrace that, I think we will be okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I know company culture is actually very important to you. You've talked about it quite a bit. How, how do you make that change? And is it harder to change when everyone is remote? I think, uh, first of all, you are so right. Company culture is indeed the number one important thing, right? As we evolve our company culture, our com company culture used to be delivering happiness meaning we do all we can to deliver happiness to our customers. When you work remotely, as long as you have very well-defined culture, 
as long as employee, they wanted to be part of this journey. They wanted to embrace the new changes. I think it's done no matter where you work in the office or working remotely for you to evolve your company culture. I think the key is by do you have a culture where you, you all your employees, they want to embrace the changes. They want to evolve your existing culture. Mm -hmm. So um, a little earlier, you were, just, you were talking about how rapidly sort of the, the number of uh, users increased during this pandemic um, and all the work you and your team have had to done to kind of keep up with that and to improve the product as you sort of found these, you know, weaknesses in it in some way. How, how's, how have you been hiring during this? Like, have you been hiring engineers? Have you, I, I know you've made some, a couple of big hires, but how do you hire right now to keep up with the speed at which you're having to deliver? Yes, yeah, great question. So, yeah, even prior to pandemic crisis, we have so many open racks, meaning we, we're still aggressively hiring. And mm -hmm. during this pandemic crisis, you know, based on the demand, based on the, the need, and also for our service, we are hiring very aggressively, you know, for engineers, for security researchers, and also sales rep, you know, not only here, all over the, uh, the, the uh, all around the globe. And take the United States, for example, we just uh, decided to open up two offices for R&D offices, like Phoenix mm -hmm. and Pittsburgh, right? And how can we quickly hire as many engineers as possible? Because used to be, we wanted to hire engineers here in Silicon Valley. But now, given everyone they work remotely, give us more flexibility. We can hire our employees, I think, in any other cities. I think give us more opportunity. I think that's why you look at our pace of hiring. I think our team did a good job. We hired a lot of people over the past several months. I, I'm happy to hear that you're still actually um, taking office space because um, as, as good as Zoom and some of these other products are, I'm, I'm not really looking forward to, to a world where we only interact through our screens. Um, so you were... Um, you're, you're a naturalized American citizen, I believe, um, but you were also denied a visa, I think about eight or nine times. So I'm just curious, given the uh, recent immigration announcements and restrictions from the current administration, if you have any comments or thoughts on that. Yes, so yes, I, I moved to Silicon Valley in 1997. And uh, yes, since then I happily lived here in Silicon Valley. But you look at the Silicon, Silicon Valley, the one of the key reasons why Silicon Valley is a worldwide innovation center is about its culture, where no matter where you are coming from, and the culture here is to, is to embrace diversity, and no matter where you are coming from, they all respect each other respect each other and still can get the job done, right? I think there's a great culture here. You know, you look at all the startup companies, a lot of startup companies, founders, they were not born here. They all moved to Silicon Valley or to other cities. I think this uh, immigration policy, I think we got to keep that. You know, otherwise, I think in 10 or 20 years, suppose you have a great company, the engineers or, or co-founders, you know, they might be immigrants. Now, if you do not keep that policy, I think that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. That will break the potential sustainable, good culture of a Silicon Valley or high-tech economy. Mm -hmm. um, if you were your, you know, 20, 22-year-old self now, would you choose to come here and start your company here? I still think so because uh, Silicon Valley is still the worldwide innovation center. You look at the great leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, VCs, engineers, and uh, access you know to those uh, you know the great companies, great technology. It's still the I think the best place if you want to focus on high tech innovation. Mm -hmm. You're very positive. That's great. Um, so. Well, I'll ask one more question and then go to another community question. Um, 
So you're, you're the Chinese born leader of one of the hottest US tech startups right now. Um, uh, how are you handling sort of the increasing tension and friction between the US and China? And do you think your background allows you to navigate it better than someone who hasn't had a lot of experience in China? I think uh, I, I do not think that my background can help. Actually, my background sometimes, in some cases, maybe even, even is causing a little bit more problems because, you know, they look at it, oh, you were born in China, oh, you are a US citizen now, and you already lived here for a longer time. They probably assume I can have a solution. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't because I'm more like an engineer or, or, or business entrepreneur, really focused on video collaboration. But for anyone to figure out a way to help, especially for those very complex problems, you got to do a deep dive to really understand the problem. Try to understand what's the root cause. Don't be eager to have a solution. You know, like the, the entrepreneurs like or, or business leaders, I think normally, you know, if you do not spend enough time to deep dive, to really understand what's the root cause, it's really hard to give others advice. You know, this is a challenge. People think, oh, Eric, what do you think? You might have a solution. Unfortunately, I even do not spend a lot of time to work on that. How could I have any solution? That's why sometimes even bigger challenge. <laughs> okay, we'll go to um, one last community question. Has the pandemic changed your future business outlook and vision on the company's purpose? What are Zoom's strategic priorities for the years ahead? It does, because we truly believe video is a new voice and working remotely will become mainstream. But this pandemic crisis literally accelerated that vision. So we got to work harder, right? How to quickly and uh, you know, have more innovative features to support this new paradigm shifting to working, working remotely. And essentially, how to support you know, every business to allow their employees working remotely still can get a job done without any frictions. That's our priority. We got to work harder because it used to be, you know, we think maybe it will take us two to three years to get us there. Now, it's already happening now. We got to quickly adapt to that change to add more innovations to support a working remotely culture. Got it. Um, we have one more question from the community. So I think we have a little bit of time left. So let's take it. Ah, what does Zoom look like in 2050? I hope, you know, we are going to keep working as hard as we can to make the world a better place. And with that, in 2050, hope a lot of people are still counting on Zoom. And I hope Zoom can deliver a much better experience than face-to-face -face meetings. Meaning, no matter where you are, any device, you can leverage Zoom. You feel like you're in the same place. And the technology can really help people stay connected better without any language barrier, without any distance barrier, without any culture barrier. With that, we feel very proud. Zoom can make the world a much better place. That's great. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question to kind of wrap this up. Um, uh, what um, opportunity do you think this crisis has brought us for some lasting positive change um, and it cannot be just working hard i think a lot like the way for us to work together the way you know when you make a decision you got to look at it from employee perspective not from employer in terms of hiring you can hire the talents all over the world right you may not need to only focus on you know your your local city anymore and also technology digital transformation for every business they got to embrace digital transformation. Otherwise, their employees, they cannot work together when they are at home. I think that overall for every business, they got to embrace digital transformation. I think that's a key trend 
I think that will drive the changes for many years to come. Great. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Um, it's great to see that you're so positive on the future. Um, thanks for spending some time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric.